as Don mentioned, ARC funded a program called Evidence Now, and we were fortunate enough to be selected as the national evaluation. Um, I'm going to talk about um, both Evidence Now and a bit about our evaluation of this program, but my goal is to weave into this the role that PBRNs play in Evidence Now, both in the past, because Evidence Now is a program, I believe, that was built on the shoulders of practice-based research networks, as well as um, currently, PBRNs invo are involved in the program, and, and where the future, what the future might hold for PBRNs. My talk really has three parts. The first part is going to be providing you with some background on the program and on the initiative. The second part is to look at um, what did the ground look like when the cooperative started two years ago? Um, what were the opportunities that were presented to them and the challenges for improving um, primary care infrastructure in their regions? And third, I'm going to talk a little bit about what strategies um, they are using to seize those opportunities. So I'm going to start with background. And I'd like to start with some of the foundational ideas, some of the ideas that are at the foundation of the Evidence Now program. All right. So every year, as many of you know, Americans suffer more than 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes. But following the ABCs of heart health, aspirin use, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, and helping patients with smoking cessation can really reduce those risks. So this slide is a slide that we developed in collaboration with Tom Kotke, who is the preventive cardiologist in our evaluation. And he and his colleagues developed a method to calculate what would happen if all evidence-based care for, um, was, was implemented for the prevention and treatment of coronary heart disease and heart failure. And what the diagram shows is the percentage of deaths per 100,000 people that would be pre prevented or postponed. And his team looked at six different acute events treated by cardiologists, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, myocardial infarction with ST stem elevation, MI without ST segment elevation, sorry, acute heart failure with low ejection fraction, unstable angina, and heart disease presenting in an ambulatory setting. And the people on the right who are in gray represent the deaths presented, prevented or postponed if all evidence-based care were implemented by cardiologists with regard to the six acute events I just described. And that would be 83 out of 100,000. On the left are the number of deaths that would be prevented or postponed of all evidence-based cardiovascular preventive care, the ABCs, were delivered in the primary care setting. And I want to point out that this is an underestimate because Tom and his team did not include in this calculation primary prevention with aspirin. Nevertheless, 150 out of 100,000 deaths would be prevented or postponed. So what you can see is that there is an 80% greater impact on patients' health by addressing the ABCs in the primary care setting than cardiologists can have by improving care for hospitalized patients. So the greatest impact on heart health accrues from the fact that treating risk factors such as the ABCs prevents multiple diseases. And that's at the foundation of Evidence Now. Now, Evidence Now is aligned with um, the Million Hearts program because the Million Hearts initiative also focuses on the ABCs of heart health. And I want to tell you a little bit about the program and about our evaluation of it. This map really doesn't look good <laughs> up here. I noticed that when Arlene had it, too. <laughs> so Evidence Now started about two years ago. And um, there are seven cooperatives funded as part as ev of Evidence Now. They cover um, seven regions of the United States, and you can see them depicted here. One of the regions, which you'll see in some of our pictures going forward, is the pop-up of the five boroughs of New York City. There are um, seven regions, 12 states, 1,500 practices that are reached, and I'm going to tell you a bit about those practices today. And we calculate based on survey results that that includes 5,000 clinicians and that the program will touch about 8.1 million patients. So the cooperatives were tasked with a number of things. They had three-year grants, so they had very short timelines. The first task was to recruit 200 primary care practices. And these practices needed to have fewer than 10 clinicians, 
and they needed to not have an internal source of quality improvement. Because the task of the cooperatives was to rapidly disseminate and implement the ABCs of heart health, that improvement to these primary care practices, on what was a very tight timeline. So we were glad not to have to recruit 200 practices. <laughs> um, and we were put in the very um, nice position of having the opportunity to watch these seven amazing cooperatives do their work for the past two years. And what this slide shows is a little bit about how we were thinking about our evaluation. So we are um, uh, trying to pull together the lessons learned across the seven cooperatives, and each of the cooperatives has their own evaluation as well. Our two main outcomes are the ABCs, which I will tell you a bit more about, and practice capacity, um, which I will also talk about. Those, the ABCs were extracted more or less from electronic health record data, and a large portion of my talk will be about those experiences. And practice capacity was measured by survey, either a, practice, a single practice survey filled out on behalf of the practice by one person, or a practice member survey that was completed um, by as many as possible um, team members in the practice. Our goal was to conduct a prospective observational study of evidence now, to follow along and to appreciate the incredible work that was happening in real time using both qualitative and quantitative data. We wanted to understand um, the, uh, how, what combination of interventions were most successful at helping practices change and improve, how the cooperatives were building this massive infrastructure to reach so many practices, um, and how practice characteristics and context were influencing this path towards change. In addition, we were tasked with rapidly disseminating our findings, and here is a shameless plug for our website called escalates.org. On it, we try to post um, early findings, stories, things of interest, and help explain um, the program, so please visit. So these are the ABC measures, um, and I think that at the very beginning, ARC did something really smart. ARC did a number of really smart things, but this one concerns the measures. It, it chose clinical quality measures, um, and I think that this was smart in part because these are the same measures, I believe, that practices might be using to improve quality in their own setting. Um, these are CMS's measures, and these are the same measures that we used for evaluation. So practices were asked to share quarterly um, practice level data, numerators and denominators, on each of these elements. In addition, we've been collecting a lot of qualitative data, um, which started with analyzing documents that the cooperatives are creating from the beginning. They're including their grant proposals to other sorts of training documents they've created. Um, for those of you who know us, we use this crazy thing called an online diary, <laughs> which asks folks from each of the cooperatives to participate in um, basically an online forum with us where we can talk with them or interact with them about their implementation experiences. There have been some work and discussion groups that have been organized for the cooperatives and we're participant observers in those. In addition, in the first two years of our work, we went out and visited each cooperative. We really wanted to understand what they looked like as organizations, how they were forming, who the folks were, who their partners were, how they were building relationships. And we spent a lot of time in our first year talking with the folks that were organizing um, the cooperatives. And in the second year, we spent quite a bit of time actually following the folks that are the boots on the ground of those cooperatives, the practice coaches and um, health IT experts and other folks working in these regions. In our third year, which we are currently just entered, we are going to be visiting some of the practices. Um, we will be visiting to see what their experience was with the Evidence Now interventions that they received and the support that they received. And those site visits include both observation and interviews. And finally, when we feel like we've lost touch, we get on the phone. So relationships really matter when you're conducting uh, kind of an appreciative evaluation. I should point out that these slides are cool, not because I have any skills in this area, but because I have a colleague who has many. <laughs> so this is uh, one of the co-leads of our qualitative evaluation, Sarah Ono, and this is a shot of her on a site visit in New Mexico. <laughs> 
So I was going to include a section on one of the early challenges that cooperatives experienced, which was recruitment. But I think I'm going to start this on a much more optimistic note. The practices are recruited, and they did a great job. <laughs> And, and PBRNs, just to keep it very short, PBRNs are really quite critical in that um, for two reasons. One is recruiting um, 200 practices really requires leveraging relationships. And those relationships need to be leveraged personally in terms of getting somebody on the phone and saying, hey, do you want to participate in evidence now? And also really understanding the world of primary care physicians and their teams. Because a lot of these practices were demanding a deep understanding of really how was evidence now going to help them and the challenges that they were currently facing. And the folks that were from the PBRNs understood that and they knew how to help the recruitment teams really align or market their message to what practices were feeling at that moment. So aligning their work with the value-based payment that practices knew was coming down the pike. In addition, just one more um, shameless PBRN plug, most of these regions didn't have PBRNs that could solely recruit 200 practices on their own. And, um, you know, they were reaching out to practices that one of the PIs referred to as in the hinterlands. These are not your typical practices. So other partners in these organizations you will see that were tapped for recruitment were um, regional extension centers, QIOs, QINs. But they were successful. So now I want to sort of introduce you to this really cool um, cohort of, of practices. Ooh, let me go back. So what this slide shows you is that each cooperative was indeed um, successful at recruiting 200 smaller primary care practices. Approximately 93% of the practices in evidence now report fewer than 10 clinicians. Almost 70% of the practices have five or less clinicians. 68% of the practices are located in urban settings, but there's a really good representation of suburban and rural practices. Um, and for whatever reasons, cooperatives like to send us out to rural practices when we do site visits. <laughs> so we've been all over the place. Um, almost a third of the practices are serving patients in medically underserved areas. And almost 40% of the practices are clinician owned. Again, with representation among other ownership types. For instance, 22% of the practices are hospital or health system owned. So now I want to show you what the terrain looked like when the cooperatives got here at baseline. And all the data I'm going to show you is baseline data. And these opportunities really fall into three categories. The first is, what did ABCS quality look like at baseline? The second is, well, how about practice capacity? What did that look like? And then I'm going to spend some time talking about data infrastructure, because that was one of um, one of the early challenges that's important for this group to hear about, but probably not something that's going to surprise you. So these are maps of the Evidence Now cooperatives. And as you'll note in the legend, um, there is overall performance shown on um, ABCS measures. So each dot, importantly, represents a zip code where there's at least one Evidence Now practice. As dots get darker, that indicates more zip codes in an area where there is at least one Evidence Now practice. Red shows zip codes where Evidence Now practice delivery performance is on average below 50%. Yellow shows delivery rates between 50 and 69%. And green shows zip codes where delivery rates are 70% or better. So this map is for aspirin. And what you can see here is that there's a pretty good mix of green and, and, and red dots, and there's some yellow. Um, but these maps show that there are certainly opportunities for improvement. This one is blood pressure, and the blood pressure one is, is interesting. It's the best measure, I would say, by far. And in part, you can see that by the colors. There's a lot more yellow in this slide and green than there is red. This is cholesterol. I'm going to talk about cholesterol later and why there aren't so many dots on this map. And this is uh, the distribution of dots for smoking cessation. And smoking cessation is also interesting, in part because there's a lot of green dots and a lot of red dots, but not so many yellow ones. 
And given some of the things that we've seen on the ground so far, we wonder if there's some documentation issues around the smoking cessation. And um, at least at this point, that's a speculation, but one that we hope will move from the realm of speculation to the realm of evidence as we go out and as we see how this measure progresses and as we talk with folks um, and collect qualitative data. So overall, the practice level mean for the clinical quality measures we're using in evidence now is between 51 to 61 percent. And this indicates that there was really good opportunity for improvement um, and for cooperatives to help practices improve their ABCs in this program. Next, I'd like to show you what the capacity landscape looked like at baseline. And I'm going to talk about capacity and using four different ways of viewing this. The first is capacity for change. The second is capacity for doing quality improvement. The third is the degree of disruption practices are facing. And I think there is a presentation by one of the cooperatives a bit later on about their experiences with disruption. And the third is how are the folks in the practice doing? Team member burnout. So we use two measures of capacity for change in evidence now. Um, the first measure is uh, adaptive reserve. I'm sorry, yes, is adaptive reserve. And adaptive reserve is a series of items that gets filled up by people in the practice to assess the organizational culture and capacity the practice has for being able to make changes. It was the same measure used in N NDP. And the second measure we used was part of the CPCQ, which is the Change Process Capability Questionnaire. And the questions that we included specifically had to do with practices reporting whether or not they were implementing, if they've implemented care quality steps, such as do they use standing orders. And the CPCQ item, if you say that you strongly disagree, you get a negative score, you get a negative number. And if you say you strongly disagree, you get a positive number. So what you can see here for CPCQ is that the negative number indicates practices that are, have implemented fewer quality improving types of strategies. And the positive numbers indicate that they have um, implemented more. And, and I think what you see from this distribution is that there is variation in, in, in practice capacity in this sample. Um, but it is skewed a bit towards the more positive. But there's lots of room for improvement. So very interestingly, uh, this slide shows what the reported uh, disruptive events were in the last 12 months. And about 52% of the practices in evidence now reported experiencing at least one major disruptive event in the tw past 12 months. And this includes things like implementing a new AHR, um, turnover in leadership, and change in ownership. And about 20% of practices reported experiencing multiple disruptive events in the 12 months prior to baseline. Now, I just want to show you quickly why we think this is important. So if you look at the factors associated with whether, to the extent to which practices report implementing quality improving strategies, one of the factors that is associated with practices doing less of this are practices that have experienced multiple, multiple major disruptive events. So experiencing disruptive event, events can really um, impair the capacity of a primary care practice. And finally, we wanted to take a look at how the people working in these busy practices are doing with regard to burnout. And this is another opportunity for cooperatives, supporting the people working in primary care practices to mitigate or um, moderate or manage burnout can really help. So we had one question about burnout in our survey, and here it is. And we looked at it both as a continuous and a um, dichotomous variable, as I've shown here. And interestingly, um, among the evidence now practices, the average burnout score is 1.9, and that falls in the I'm feeling stressed but not burned out range. But this is an average, and as this slide shows, um, there are practices certainly that have higher and lower levels of burnout. This does seem a little bit lower than we'd expect, and there's certainly more work that we need to do to understand what's happening with burnout in these practices. Um, Nevertheless, if you dig a little bit deeper, you can see that um, among the 8,699 <laughs> practice member surveys, 20% report, reported burnout, and physician burnout was the highest at close to 
Um, and over 20% of nurse practitioners and physician's assistants and clinical staff also reported feeling burned out. Non-clinical staff reported feeling burned out at a, low, at a lower rate. And I think there's some digging to be done here and, and some of the work that the, the cooperatives are, are doing as they, as they think about how to manage this is thinking about, well, where is this burnout manifesting? And it seems as though, at least initially, that people working in non-solo practices are experiencing more burnout. People working in non-clinician-owned practices are experiencing more burnout. Um, people with excessive workloads, and I don't think there's anything that folks would find surprising here. Um, and people who see misalignment um, between incentives and perhaps the meaning of their work. So practices that were involved in programs like meaningful use and ACO programs reported higher levels of burnout than some of the other practices not involved in those programs. So that's what the ABC's landscape looked like and what the capacity landscape look, looked like. Now I'd like to talk about what the data infrastructure landscape looked like in evidence now. This was by far one of the greatest challenges for cooperatives in the first two years of evidence now. And it's um, therefore, in my opinion, one of the greatest opportunities. I'm going to focus my discussion on clinical quality measures for ABCs. And I don't have my evaluator's hat on here. So while we use these ABC measures in our evaluation of outcomes for evidence now, as the cooperatives do, I want to think about, and I'd like us all to think about, how practices might use these clinical quality measures in, in quality improvement. If, as Arlene pointed out, they're to emerge as learning health systems, they need to have access to some data to understand how they're doing. And, and you know, clinical quality measures would seem to be a reasonable choice. So let me tell you a little bit about what the sample looked like in terms of EHR characteristics. So over 90% of the practices in this sample use an, use an EHR. And, and although that number is very high, it's hard for me to even imagine what the 10% that aren't using one are doing because of the data that they have to produce. Um, predominantly, these are practices using ONC certified EHRs as of 2014. As you can see from this table, there are 68 different EHR systems represented across the cooperatives and very wide vari variation in how many EHR systems are being used by practices, with one cooperative supporting only four EHR systems and another other supporting as, as many as 32. Approximately 60% of these practices have participated in stage one and stage two of meaningful use. And nearly 70% of the practices report that they don't have anybody in their practice that can create a clinical quality report. But 40% of them do have that capacity if, by contracting with somebody outside of their practice walls. So I want to start off by sharing what I think are the data requirements for using um, data in quality improvement. The first is that clinical quality measures must reflect current guidelines. Practices must be able to generate credible clinical quality measures, reports. Reporting measurement periods must be customizable. Quality improvement, generally speaking, works on short plan, do, study, act cycles, or short cycles of change. So if a practice wants to use data to drive those efforts, they need to be able to get data sometimes for a day, sometimes for a week, sometimes for a month to be able to take a look and see, well, when we started to bring in our patients um, to get a blood pressure recheck, how did we do? They need to be able to look at those data on short periods of time or whatever period of time they choose. Reports also must be adaptable at the level of the practice. Sometimes you want to know how your overall practice is doing on a clinical quality measure that you care about. At the clinical team um, and at the clinician level, and sometimes in larger practices or in practices where they work in teams, one team may be doing exceptionally well on, on meeting the, the cholesterol management guideline, and another might not be doing well. And, and knowing that allows people within a practice to share what's working and what's not and to spread their good ideas. And finally, Data needs to be available at the patient level. Practices need to be able to generate lists of patients to both prepare for visits and to do outreach to get patients in who haven't been in for a while. And finally, 
particularly with uh, alternative payment models, um, the data from EHRs needs to be comparable across EHRs and across practices. So I want to start off by just listing the challenges that were observed around data infrastructure at baseline, and then I'm just going to dig into a couple of them to give you some more detailed examples. So we ran into some trouble with the pace and quality of measure specification. ONC certified EHRs lack customizable measurement periods. Vendors were charging excessive fees, often for customization and upgrades required, oftentimes for basic reporting functionality. Vendors were also unresponsive to requests when reporting problems emerged. There was limited technical capacity and skill set at a practice. I was rereading some field notes from a site visit, and one of the HIT experts was quoted that um, health information technology capacity in small practices is as close to zero as it can possibly be. And that's not surprising. These are small practices. Often it's somebody's son, somebody's uncle, somebody's brother, somebody's daughter that does this work. Um, I've clumped together EHR system design, documenting behavior, and EHR programming. And that's when I'll dig in. I'll explain that a little bit more and what I'm thinking there. And finally, there's definitely a lack of comparability within and across EHR systems. So there's a couple of these I want to dig into, in part because maybe I found them the most surprising. So in 2013, there was a new guideline release for how to manage cholesterol. And if you remember, I showed you the slide with very few dots on it. So our program started in 2015, and at that time, the federal government hadn't yet released a value set for this new cholesterol measure. Now, I'm going to put what a value set is in lay terms because I am a lay person, but essentially it is the combination of codes and numbers that an EHR vendor or programmer would use to actually calculate the new measure that's aligned with this new guideline. So there was no new value set in 2015, and we paid a company to actually create one um, for evidence now because we knew that there were some systems that could do the programming for this, not all of them. It's now two years later and there still isn't a value set available for this new cholesterol guideline. So none of the practices that are relying on their electronic health record systems to generate reports can generate the cholesterol measure. They can't get data out of their EHRs on this new guideline. Experts that we've talked to that are involved in evidence now don't expect to see it till 2018. And at that point, that guideline doesn't actually get to your practices until they've implemented an upgrade and started using it. So really, from the time a new guideline is released to the time it gets into an EHR that a practice can use it as part of a learning system, looks like it might be at least five years. And, and that was a part of the um, quality translation highway pathway that I didn't know about before I got involved in this. It was surprising. The other one of these that I want to, um, there's two more of these I want to dig into. The, the next one is the ONC certified EHRs. Now, ONC certified EHRs are certified to allow practices to do their PQRS reporting. PQRS reporting happens on an annual basis, so the reports are generally you know, January to December, 12-month reporting periods. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, ARC required and cooperatives are looking at data coming out of the EHRs on a quarterly basis. And I think one of the um, biggest surprises was just the magnitude of EHRs that could not produce a quarterly report. So if you think about data that's needed by a practice for quality improvement, having a customizable reporting period, the EHRs that most practices are using don't have me measurement period. Most practices aren't able to um, produce a report with a customizable measurement period. They can't look at their ABCs data for a week or for a month. They can only look at it for a year, which as those of you that work with practices know isn't really the right interval for quality improvement. And that's been very surprising. Part of what we've heard um, that I think complements that qualitatively is that practices aren't looking at their PQRS data. They send it in and they've met the requirement and that on a number of occasions where a practice coach has then brought this back to them and said, here it is, they look at it and they don't think it's believable. They find problems with it. 
Now that tide is changing, I think, as folks are now getting, um, preparing for the fact that they may get paid based on these data, but certified EHRs are not really designed at this point to help support practices in doing quality improvement. And then the third and final one of these I'm going to dig into is the issues around EHR design, documenting behavior, and EHR programming. So one of the things that we hear a lot about in the field, um, and, and let, first let me tell you how those three things are connected. So the design of the EHR drives documenting behavior. And um, I'm going to talk in my next section about some of the data infrastructure in some of these regions. And in some regions, it's a, um, it's a data warehouse or a data hub that's able to extract data from the EHR. And that work is largely driven by programmers who sit down and they write code, and their code tells the computer from whence to extract data. So if you have an EHR that's designed with multiple places where the same information can be entered, or, and folks in a practice document that information in different places. If your programmer doesn't know to write code to pull data from all of those places, your numerators and denominators do not look right. That data doesn't pass the sniff test. And there are a lot of different versions of how that particular story can manifest itself in data that doesn't look credible to a primary care clinician and his or her team. But as those of you that work with practices on change know, if you're not starting with credible data, often you're not starting. Um, practices want to see something. They want to know how they're doing. So now we're going to move on from the opportunities that I showed you to what some of the strategies are that practices are, that cooperatives are using to help practices seize the opportunity to take these strategies and to strengthen primary care. So this is another slide that I always giggle at because we were brainstorming what kind of a picture to include when you talk about the agricultural extension and farming in the United States. And I always think about this slide as a, a city person's view of what farming is like, and it's not a very, uh, it's a pretty dismal picture. A lot of you probably know about um, this idea of practice extension. I just want to spend a couple of time, minutes on this for those that don't. In the early 1900s, the agriculture extension system was developed in the United States, and it transformed agriculture. Very, very simply, the government gave each state a grant, and that grant was um, directed to a state university. In New Jersey, it was Rutgers. In Oregon, it was Oregon State University. And with this money, the state built infrastructure and expertise to help farmers do a better job of farming. The extension service engaged in many activities to educate and support farmers and to promote dissemination and implementation of better farming practices. And to a large extent, this included building relationships with and among farmers in much the way practice-based researchers do, and sharing farming expertise and insights. In a lot of ways, the practice Primary care practice extension is, ag is ag analogous to the agriculture extension in that the cooperatives, the regional organizations, are developing the infrastructure to build relationships with practices in their region with the purpose of learning about their needs and supporting practices and sustaining themselves and providing excellent care to the patients they serve. The practice extension was an approved and unfunded mandate of the U.S. legislature and this is a lens that I am um, going to use as we view the evidence now and to frame how we think about the strategies cooperatives are using to help practices and really take quality improvement to scale. Keep in mind, in a matter of about a year and a half, they're reaching 200 primary care practices, many of them not close at all, as you can see from the dots on those maps, to what might be the academic health center. Importantly, practice extensions are built on the shoulders of PBRNs, and, and, and that's a bit of what I'm going to try to show you from these diagrams. So we created a diagram like this for, for each of the cooperatives, um, and I'm just going to show you two, but if you go to escalates.org, you can see all of them. So this is a diagram for Healthy Hearts Northwest, which covers the Washington, Oregon, and Idaho region. And one of the characteristics of this cooperative is that it covers a multi-state region. This is a region that includes urban, suburban, and rural settings. Um, Kaiser um, is the evaluation lead in the, in where the research um, is housed. And there's a partnership that's making this particular cooperative work that includes Qualys, 
which is a regional extension in QIN, a, region, a regional extension center in QIN, and ORPRAN, which is a practice-based research network in Oregon. What these partners have brought together is really boots on the ground in a couple of different ways. The first is boots on the ground in terms of practice facilitation. They have practice facilitators that are able to blanket their regions, and many of them are located out in different parts of the state and connected with their communities. The second is health information technology expertise that are also able to reach out to these practices and support them. And then the third is simply the clinical expertise um, that's at the heart of helping with disseminating the ABCs. A separate model, um, and I was just talking with Zolt about this earlier, is um, Healthy Hearts for Oklahoma. And in contrast to that, the Northwest region, Oklahoma Cooperative covers a single state. Again, um, the Academic Health Center, which is the University of Oklahoma that has two different locations, one in Tulsa and one in Oklahoma City, are the evaluation lead and, the, and, and at the, um, uh, in some ways at the helm of this work. They have a partnership with um, an organization called My Health, um, Oklahoma had a Beacon Grant several years ago and was able to lay the foundation for building a health information exchange in their region, and my health is their health information exchange. And I will talk about that in a bit, but they bring health IT expertise and capacity to the practices and have been working with the Oklahoma Foundation um, for Medical Quality, which is the regional extension, to put boots on the crown to help practices with reporting and connecting their practices to the HIE. In addition, there are a number of, this is a really interesting um, primary health care extension system in that there's been a vision by Jim Mould and others who have been part of the PBRN in this region to really build um, partnerships across the counties and the state and the public health sectors. So you can see that there are a number of um, state departments of health at the county level and a number of community partners who are located in those communities to build connections between communities and practices and the academic health system. One of the reasons I was talking with Zolt is I couldn't, I wasn't intimately involved in creating this one and I couldn't remember where their PBRN was located in this model, but it's in here because it's on the shoulders of this PBRN that this whole work is being done. Many of you may know that the Oklahoma PBRN is the home of the P's, the practice enhancement assistants, and they are the boots on the ground for practice change in this region. So what are these practice extensions doing? They're providing data infrastructure and health IT expertise. They're providing practice facilitation or coaching to help with quality improvement. They're offering expert consultation, which many of you may know by the term of academic detailing, but they're bringing the clinical expertise of the physician researchers in the academy out to the folks in, the, in their states. They're offering online learning opportunities, they're creating learning collaboratives, they're creating peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, and they're engaging communities and their patients. In addition, they're creating the content that's delivered through these modes of connecting and learning, such as educational materials related to ABCs, how to take a good blood pressure, which is more complicated than I realized when I got into this, um, and also educating practices about quality improvement itself. So, I'm going to speak about two specific strategies. I'm going to talk about the health information technology and the practice facilitation support, specifically, starting with health information technology. So I think I mentioned earlier that these regions had different um, infrastructure at baseline, and I just want to highlight those differences. We really saw three different types of infrastructure. The first um, type is the data warehouse or data hub and essentially this is an organization in a region that um, works with practices to extract data from the back end of the EHR and put it into a warehouse or hub where it can be cleaned or normalized and then where it can be um, uh, shared with practices in a way that they get the kinds of more meaningful quality improvement reports that I was describing. In evidence now, there was one region, and that was the New York City Cooperative, that had already established data warehouse and data hub expertise in their region prior to the start of evidence now. All of the practices that they engaged were already connected 
more or less, to these organizations. And when I pointed out in my table earlier that there was one cooperative that was supporting four EHR systems, that's the New York City region. And that work had been done through a great deal of investment through their Department of Health and um, Mental Hygiene prior to Evidence Now. There are a couple of other cooperatives that are building um, one in particular that are using evidence now to build this kind of infrastructure in their region. And that has kicked up some interesting challenges of working with vendors and the expenses related to trying to make those back-end connections with EHRs. The second data infrastructure that was um, available in the Oklahoma region only as an HIE, um, and, and I say that tentatively because North Carolina also has data infrastructure, and it's hard to know the extent to which it's currently an HIE or more like a data warehouse or hub, but it's in that same um, family. And the only difference between an HIE and a data hub are the folks contributing data. So here it's not just primary care practices, it's ideally all of the um, organizations delivering health care in a community because the idea is not just to um, be able to provide dashboards and other kinds of tools to practices that help them monitor and improve quality, but to also share information for patients across those organizations. And then the third um, data infrastructure we saw was um, cooperatives that didn't have this kind of data infrastructure in their region and were relying on the um, infrastructure of the native EHR system to help practices produce reports for quality improvement. So what have the um, cooperatives done to help practices? They have certainly invested a lot of time and money to develop partnerships with HIT experts in their regions to help build the data infrastructure and data capacity of the primary care practices that they're serving. They've worked directly with vendors in two different ways. They've worked with vendors on behalf of their practices to try to get reports out of EHRs, sometimes um, finding secret buttons um, that can be used <laughs> that nobody knew about to make sure that, um, for example, smoking cessation counseling gets counted. They also have been working with vendors to do um, what is essentially batch extraction of data through either continuity care documents or some other programming. Oftentimes, vendors are critical in those relationships and it, it was very slow and very arduous work to be able to get data out of these EHRs on a large scale. They have definitely designed additional tools, usually in the form of dashboards, to help supplement the reporting functionality of practices so that they can, practices can reduce, produce the kinds of reports they need to emerge as learning systems and to improve quality. And they have been the boots on the ground, directly working with practices. If you recall the bullet where I said there's this interesting combination of programmers trying to extract data from an EHR, clinical teams documenting in the EHR, and, and EHRs that may be designed to allow data to um, be put in, in, in a bunch of different structured fields, it's the boots on the ground that sorts out the problems that manifest from, from those wonky relationships. So when a programmer produces a report that the practice doesn't find credible, somebody needs to go to that practice, either virtually or in person, to understand where they're documenting and where they're putting things and why it's not being counted to produce a more credible report. So it's, it's really fair to say that the health information technology expertise that the cooperatives are bringing to their practices are just a critical element of evidence now, as well as a critical element of the emerging primary care extensions in these regions. Next, I wanna move on to practice facilitation and coaching. And this was really interesting um, to me as, as well. So, so keep in mind that um, all of the cooperatives were providing some form of coaching, and it was fairly intense. So practices were receiving somewhere between nine and 12 months of coaching from a facilitator, um, and that could be weekly or monthly, but there was a lot of intense touches. And if you remember the, the zip codes on the map, these practices are spread all over these regions. So the cooperatives really had to um, develop the regional infrastructure for practice facilitation, and each cooperative started at a slightly different place at baseline. 
They identified a professional workforce. Sometimes those were across organizations. Sometimes that workforce was, in a sing was within a single organization. And they trained these practice facilitators. These practice facilitators had to reach distant practices. Now, some of them were located very far out from home base. So they were not part of the academic health center that was overseeing this. And some of them, even if they were far out from home base, were still spending a lot of time driving to their practices. But that raises some issues about how do you know if somebody that is, you know, 500 miles from their practice facilitator lead, how do you know what they're doing? How do you know that they're helping their practices or what the quality of their work is? And there's some ways that we saw the cooperatives building infrastructure to manage this challenge. The first was um, in terms of the tools and guides that they developed to support facilitator work. Some of the most robust materials for helping support facilitators manage the change process with their practices and also uh, have materials for the practices that I've ever seen were developed in evidence now. And my understanding is that those will at some point become um, publicly available. In addition, they have taken steps to assure quality um, by asking facilitators to track the work that they're doing and having someone take a look at that to see what's going on. We know in some cooperatives that that has definitely identified folks where they're worried and then they've done additional outreach. Um, by having folks go out and observe facilitators um, and by creating a number of different peer-to-peer -peer facilitator learning opportunities. In a number of cooperatives, it is standard for facilitators to get together either in person or virtually, weekly or bi-weekly, to share, um, to support each other. Um, we spent the last year observing about 41 different practice facilitators and, and coaches, and as anyone that does this work knows, it is definitely emotional labor. Um, you are going in and working with a, a lot of people, and sometimes that goes great, and sometimes it's very challenging. And having places where um, facilitators can come together to share their challenges and also sharpen the tools of their craft becomes really critical to um, quality assurance. And here again, the PBRN role was, was, um, was critical. Practice-based research networks in this region were often the home of these P's and um, practice, ex practice facilitators. They had the expertise and they knew what practices needed. So this is my attempt at a very limited list of all of the good things that practice coaches and facilitators do. And um, I was reading through some of the data on the plane ride here, and I've only read through part of it, and I've come up with a much longer list than this. So this is just some, some of the highlights. But facilitators absolutely help practices learn how to produce patient lists, and they help with PDSA cycles, and importantly, they set goals and hold practices accountable to making changes. Um, that practices identify to improve their systems and their ABCs. They educate practice staff. They share approaches and ideas across practices for improving quality. They connect peers. They observe and help with workflow changes. Um, they work behind the scenes to help build practice staff capacity for practice leadership and quality improvement. They help with EHR problems. They sometimes get on the phone with vendors when there isn't anyone in the practice that can really totally explain what's going on with their EHR and what they need. They help practices address other system issues that may not necessarily be directly related to ABCs but might directly help improve ABCs. And they do a whole lot to help support practices. So, so part of what, I, what I'm here to say is that the health IT expertise and the practice facilitation expertise that these cooperatives have mobilized have been absolutely critical to lending practices a helping hand and help them overcome some of the challenges and seize some of the opportunities for really delivering high quality primary care in their region. As a qualitative and mixed methods researcher, I wanted to end on a note of trying to bring together um, some data. And this, is a, a, this table shows um, the performance of one practice <laughs> and, and evidence now. And it just so happens that it was a practice that I also visited with a facilitator. So the black line represents the average um, delivery performance across all evidence now practices from whom um, we've received three quarters of data. Actually, it's not all the practices. It's a ram random sample of 100 uh, practices from whom we've received three quarters of data. 
On the far left is aspirin, uh, then blood pressure, then cholesterol, and, and smoking. And the blue line represents this particular practice's pattern of change over those three quarters. And I just want to read to you a little bit about, um, from my field notes, about what we observed from the field. From this site visit with the practice facilitator, we learned that this practice is working on all four ABCs. During the meeting with the practice facilitator, um, the facilitator shows the practice these data. I should point out that the only reason the practice facilitator could show the practice these data was because this particular cooperative created a dashboard that allowed this person to do that. They are looking at something similar to what we're looking at here. They talk about why their aspirin scores are relatively flat, and the facilitator says, when practices investigate this, they find that most patients have a good reason for not being on aspirin. The aspirin measure, the facilitator explains, does not allow those who are on other anticoagulants to be excluded all the time, and there are a number of patients on anticoagulants that should not be on aspirin in this denominator. He says that the new measure, or she says that the new measure definition next year does, not allow, does allow for exclusions for some things. The facilitator is encouraging and gives them lots of positive reinforcement for the level at which they are already working. Next, the facilitator talks about blood pressure. In 2015, the facilitator reports this practice is blood pressure um, measures were at 50%, and now they're up to 61%. The facilitator comments that this is an impressive change, and he comments that change in measures like this are generally slow. He encourages the practice to be patient. The facilitator also hands the practice a protocol for hypertension. This is a protocol another practice developed that could be implemented to further systematize identification and treatment of hypertension at their practice. One of the things that facilitators do is disseminate good ideas from practices to practices. So this is a suggestion that the facilitator um, is offering that the practice might try. She points out that this worked well in another practice. Someone from the practice notes that, the, that implementing this protocol is part of a study. They are participating in this study, but they've been asked to hold off on implementing this protocol. This is something that they'll implement in July. And here I always laugh because this is the role of mighty context plays in research. It is really quite possible that this particular practice won't implement this next step in their improvement until after measurement and intervention is done because they're participating in another study. Now the good part of them participating in this other study is that they've been highly motivated to improve their blood pressure, but it's just the way it rolls in this kind of work. The practice facilitator accepts this and notes that their blood pressure numbers are already improving. Um, again, acknowledging the positive and congratulating the practice. The group acknowledges this and attributes this change to efforts in identifying patients with high blood pressure. The facilitator then moves on to cholesterol. This practice, we learn, is working on developing a PDSA cycle that would include an EHR-based reminder for clinicians and better documentation of patients who decline a statin. They've started this developmental work, but they've not started implementing the change. They mention that they can also generate patient lists and do outreach, which is an idea for a next step. Maybe they'll try outreach. One member of the team also notes that one clinician has had a lot of patients that decline statin. In response, the facilitators suggest that they could try a decision aid with some patients um, with no documentation of prior discussion. There's some interest in this, but no commitment yet and the facilitator kind of lets this idea percolate a bit. Finally, the facilitator turns to look at smoking cessation. She reports that smoking scores are already high and they've improved slightly. He congratulates the team saying those numbers are awesome and they've been really steady. The team reports that they did some retraining to make sure that the staff were updating smoking screening and cessation. They also have a new workflow for this, but they've not started using it. Here I want to point out that change is incremental in primary care practices, that you can see these little steps that practices are taking to keep kicking the can down the road, to keep improving um, the care that they're providing. One doctor comments that this new workflow is a has a nice concept, but there are really a lot of pros and cons to documentation. And what's nice about these QI meetings is that folks can surface the good and the not so good and address those. They talk about this a bit, and they highlight that the new documentation is good because uh, it includes a link right to the document um, where you need to assess 
do assessment and counseling, but it does include a few extra clicks. So all I wanted to give you a glimpse of is just what the work looks like on the ground as these facilitators are working shoulder to shoulder with practices and to show that there really are, at least it seems, some explanations for these run charts, essentially, of quality improvement changes. So I'd like to end on a note um, of what the future opportunities might be, building on evidence now for PBRNs. And we brainstormed a number of questions um, that PBRNs might pick up from this work. One is what's really going on with burnout. Um, it may very well be that the practices that had the capacity to gauge, engage in evidence now are experiencing less burnout than those that weren't able to engage. We, we may be able to look at some of that by um, uh, looking across the waves, some of the practices that signed on to evidence now later, but there's a lot of work to be done to understand burnout. What are some of the strategies for assessing and reporting data now and in the future? What role can PBRNs play? How are practices using or not using all the data they now have available about their practices and their practice performance? How do practices adapt to becoming an employed practice? We have a number of practices that are hospital and health system owned or are recently transitioning to those. And there's still a role to be played for PBRNs and for practice support and facilitation. And it's really interesting to see how that's manifesting. And what's the importance of culture and its intentional development at the practice level in both adaptability and in the ability to achieve performance? Excellence. So this is a very big initiative. You can't deal with seven cooperatives and 1,500 practices without an amazing team. And there are just a few people I'd like to highlight in this picture. So in the bottom right, um, the second person in is Leah Gordon. She is our pro project director. And without this, we couldn't do any of this work. Um, Sarah Ono and Ben Crabtree are leading our qualitative team. Bajal Balasubramanian and Miguel Marino are leading our quantitative team. Um, Will Miller is uh, our, NAC, our National Advisory Committee lead. Laith, is le Laith Solberg is leading dissemination. And in the bottom left, you can see Claire Diner, and she's the one that made this, these slides look so cool. So thank you for inviting me to talk to your group, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.